So we're here with Mike Nemeth, who is head of the insurance practice at WNS Global Services, and Peter Fader, Wharton marketing professor, and most recently co-director of the Wharton Customer Analytics Initiative. Welcome to both of you. Good day. Thank you, So Deborah. we're here to talk about the insurance industry. First off, in what areas of customer experience will analytics have the most impact in insurance? I think the obvious uh, answer is that traditionally uh, in the insurance world, you have three contacts generally with your insurance carrier, right? You buy a policy, you submit a claim, and you renew a policy. Those are the three traditional, large, predictable uh, touch points, right? And, and analytics uh, can be extremely helpful in all three of those instances. But I think especially in the life insurance industry, people are thinking more now in terms of uh, predictive analytics, if you will, predicting when will you, in fact, have an interaction with your insurance carrier. Because life insurance is really about a, a journey in your lifetime, right? And various of your life experiences trigger the needs uh, that insurance carriers provide solutions for. Uh, you graduate from college, uh, you get married, you have children, you begin preparing for your retirement, uh, you have grandchildren, you want to travel, uh, you need invested, invested monies uh, to pay for all of those things. So in the life industry now, they're, they're really trying to align themselves with the events that are going to occur in their customers' lifetimes, both to create a better uh, customer experience. We know uh, that you just got married. Here's what you need, uh, and we can help you with that as an example. But, but also, uh, in addition to improving the, the, the customer experience, obviously it expands the wallet share of the supplier of the insurance, right? Uh, too often, uh, producers, agents, sell the products that are easy to sell. Uh, everybody runs around and sells a little term life insurance, right? Because that's mandatory. Everybody needs it. So they sell that. And that's all they sell. And they make a decent living. So they're not very well motivated to go back and sell the rest of the wallet, uh, uh, the rest of the lifetime experiences. And analytics now helps the insurance carrier know who are the good producers, which of their customers are getting good service from the companies, uh, and, and what do they need to emphasize going forward? This is textbook customer centricity, at least the way that I defined it in my own book on customer centricity, which is if we can figure out who the right kinds of customers are, and insurance companies are very good at that. They know who the good risks are. They know who the ones who are going to be around for a while and pay their premiums. If we can figure out who the right kinds of customers are, that just opens the door. It's what follows that, that, that really matters. If we can figure out other ways to enhance the value of those customers, so it's not just maintaining the premiums that we're getting from them, it's not just selling them maybe just some separate unrelated policy, but if we can be a true trusted advisor and find ways to, to give them uh, and recommend them to other kinds of products and services that might actually have nothing to do with insurance, but might have more to do with some of those other life events that themselves might be associated with changes in their insurance. Again, if they can see us as a trusted advisor to kind of tell them what to do, then it's going to be that much easier to extract some of that created value from them and, by the way, to identify other future policyholders who share some of the same kinds of characteristics. So as we move away from just selling that policy, you know, to taking my, my little piece of it as a sales agent, and instead focusing on lifetime value of how much more can we create from and extract from this, this customer, that's real customer centricity. And here's an industry that's in a great position to really take advantage of it. Can you talk in greater detail about how insurance companies can use analytics to improve sales, retain clients, and improve their brand image? Yes. So a analytics can be a part of that entire picture. Uh, I, I think the insurance industry is just uh, a fertile ground uh, for analytics. They apply to all of those facets of an insurance carrier's business. Uh, but in particular, what we're seeing now is not only a desire to do a better job, but a desire to measure how good a job am I, in fact, doing for my customers. And so analytics are being focused pretty tightly on things like customer satisfaction metrics and net promoter score. 
uh, as ways of measuring how well am I doing. And then once they've measured how well they're doing, they can then fine tune what they're doing to create better uh, net promoter scores, better uh, customer satisfaction scores. So you get you get a, uh, uh, a closed loop uh, effect uh, where you're doing analytics at the, on the front, you're testing those analytics, you're measuring, uh, and then you're adjusting your behavior as you go forward. Talking about the closed loop, one of the really remarkable, unique things about the insurance industry would be actuaries. That was actually my first job while I was in college is I was an actuary just measuring these risks and predicting the value of customers. So here's an industry that already appreciates the ability to, to predict and profile and figure out what are the right kinds of variables, what's the right balance between, say, demographics and, and other kinds of, of behaviors and so on. So we have an industry that already thinks in terms of risk and probabilities and differences among different kinds of customers. So it, it, it may be easier said than done, but it's a matter of taking some of the actuarial thinking and just bring it over to the business side as well. Because it's, it's actually quite remarkable that a lot of the research that I do as a professor, I am literally building the same kinds of actuarial models, but instead of predicting when someone's going to die, I'm predicting when they're going to buy. But it's the same statistical assumptions, it's the same kinds of values that go into this kind of work. So it's actually not a tremendous leap for folks in insurance to embrace what they already have in that closed loop yeah. e ecosystem and to do more with it. And we're seeing more and more insurance companies starting to have that conversation across different parts of the company where they actually can learn and benefit from each other. How can insurance companies use analytics to cut costs and streamline claims processes? This one might surprise you. Uh, it turns out that uh, customer satisfaction with the claims process has more to do with the efficiency of the process than it does with what's what's my resulting payment. Uh, when you know what, how much money do I get for my claim? Because because the claims process, when it's uh, uh, difficult, when it's difficult to submit a claim, when it's difficult to understand what your status is, what the next steps are, uh, who's taking care of this for me, uh, when am I going to get my house repaired, when is my car going to be repaired, that set of interactions, when they go smoothly, uh, is actually more satisfying to the claimant than is how much money did I get. What that really means is that insurance companies have to do a better job of triage, just like in hospital emergency rooms. Uh, claims need to be triaged when they come in uh, to an insurance company. Is this a simple claim that should be paid today? Uh, is this a claim that uh, can be investigated simply with police reports or the information that's provided by the claimant? Or do I need to assign an adjuster? Does the adjuster have to go out and see the damage and the repair? Or can I simply refer the customer to a repair shop and have them go ahead and get their car repaired if it was damaged in an accident? Or is it something more ser serious? Do I need a serious senior adjuster? Am I going to end up in litigation? Is this somehow fraudulent? Do I have to worry about a special investigation for this thing? So knowing all those different paths that claims can take, and if you can know that at the time you would take the initial claims report and put the claim on the proper path, you not only save money, but you also improve customer satisfaction. And in order to know what path to take, you must have done your analytics homework to understand the characteristics of every kind of claims report that comes in the door. I love Mike's answer. I don't like the question. <laughs> and here's the difference. <laughs> the question asked about costs, but Mike's answer was more about enhancing value. And I think that's what we really want to focus on. I mean, not to, to ignore costs. That's, that's certainly a big piece of the equation. But, you know, companies have been pretty cognizant of costs forever. You know, we, we have this visceral reaction. We know what the costs are. But it's a little bit harder to measure, to anticipate, to really appreciate the value that we create by, by handling claims the right way. So, again, we, we do want to be efficient. Don't get me wrong. But I think there's, there's more needle-moving opportunity to value enhancing than there is to cost cutting. And I think a lot of the steps and the analytics underlying those steps that Mike just spoke about are ways to 
primarily enhance value while at the same time of, of you know, keeping costs in check. But I think it's very important to recognize both opportunities through analytics, and in many cases, including this one, it's more about value creation than it is about cost minimization. So cost savings become a byproduct of good customer service, and what could possibly be a better way to do business? So how can insurers use analytics to figure out the optimal, optimal mix of distribution channels? You know, this is a question that's a little bit premature, actually, in the maturation of the industry. The trend today, so maybe I'll go back in time. The trend used to be that you chose a singular distribution channel. Uh, there are the well-known, very large insurance companies that we see advertised all the time who had their own company agents, right? You would go to one of their field offices and speak to a human being and sign up for insurance. And, and that was a, a, a trusted distribution channel for decades. Uh, then we began to see all of this disintermediation, the effect of online capabilities and the internet, the effect of uh, being able to call a call center, speak to someone over the telephone, uh, and, and that really had a, a, an impact on how people thought about distribution. And so their reaction today is, I need to be everywhere. And so everybody now wants to have their own agents, independent agents, an online presence, a, a call center capability. Everybody wants to be everywhere. And so a future step will be now analyzing, do you really want to be everywhere given the kind of customer you have and the kind of products you're selling to your customer? What are, in fact, the optimal mixes of distribution channels for your particular business. So we're, we're actually talking a little bit about something that's going to happen tomorrow. I, I, I'm trying to make that future happen today, uh, yeah. at least in my academic work, which is one way to sort this out. Because yes, uh, every company wants to be everywhere, but that's expensive. Uh, and so we got to figure out where is it that we're going to get the best ROI. And it's not just a matter of just booking uh, getting more policies tomorrow. It's a matter of creating, I sound like a broken record, customer lifetime value. So if we can uh, look at, at each agent that we have or each office or each channel and say, what's the CLV of the, the customers, of the policyholders wh whom we acquire through that channel? Or through the activities of those agents, how have they enhanced by being a trusted advisor the, the value of existing customers? We can start to use that as kind of a, as a, as a gold standard metric to start to say, well, you have this incremental dollar to spend, which kind of, of channel or which specific agency should we be spending it on? So I think using forward-looking metrics, which of course arises from this, this push towards analytics, is going to make it, I don't want to say it's going to be easy, but it's going to give us at least an objective way to figure out uh, how we can allocate uh, the, this, this important spend decision. And I think it all fits hand in hand. The kinds of calculations that lead to CLV will arise quite naturally from the other kinds of analytic activities that Mike was talking about earlier. Well, great. So what are some best practices that companies should follow in setting up data and analytics governance programs? And how do you get company-wide support for such initiatives? Yeah, I think uh, there, those are, there are two questions there, but there's a connection between them. So I think one best practice is un understanding that there's a preparatory phase uh, in aggregating organizing, transforming data for use, but that, that isn't the end game. Uh, I, know, I know Peter would agree with me that mm -hmm. there's probably a little too much emphasis on that preparatory step and not enough emphasis on let's do something with that data. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, second best practice, I think, is incorporating domain expertise into the analytics teams. I believe that what this means in practice is having different analytics teams for different domains within a business. Uh, for example, uh, a typical property and casualty company is going to have a personal lines business where they sell insurance to us, also a commercial lines business where they sell insurance to businesses. Uh, and, and those are really two different domains and require different analytics teams. 
And that probably means that you need some sort of an umbrella over the top of those domains. But on the actual project teams, you need domain expertise because, because the key to having a successful analytics practice within an insurance company is really being able to generate a return on investment. In order to generate a return on investment, you need the domain experts because they're the people who understand what questions should be answered. I call it right to left thinking. So for, for our viewers, that would be this way. Uh, on a whiteboard where we start with what are the answers we're looking for and then we work back through how are we going to find those answers? What data do we need? What domain expertise? What are the right analytics tools? What are the right analytics uh, approaches, methodologies to apply uh, to get those particular answers? And if we get valuable answers, then we'll generate a return on investment. And if we generate a return on investment, we will then get uh, uh, ad adoption within the organization and support within the organization for what we're doing. Let me pick up on the last point that Mike raised. And he, he talks about going right to left. I'm going to talk about going from top to bottom, which is getting that buy-in. I, I like the idea of having that domain expertise, of having these kind of local experts in each of the different uh, uh, product lines doing their analytics thing, but then you have to have this umbrella. Then you're going to have this overall center of excellence that's going to be helping to coordinate all them. Here's the issue. You can't do that from bottom up. What happens with a lot of companies is very often it's the marketing people who say, hey, listen, we've got all this data and predictive analytics and we can do all this stuff here. We can, we can kind of make marketing better. Uh, and the rest of the organization say, okay, marketing, do, do whatever you want. Knock yourself out. That's great. But unless you can create it that's truly enterprise-wide, unless it's going to involve the, the people in, in all the different functional areas, it's going to have limited impact. It has to come from the top. It has to come from the C level. It has to be C level people not just tolerating these analytics because it's going to keep the marketing people happy, happy but it, it has to be them embracing it. And here's an industry, again, given the actuarial heritage, an industry that, that isn't afraid of data, that understands risks and probabilities. Let's do it from the top. Let's have a high level analytical vision and let's build that umbrella and let's kind of sow the seeds for the different domain expertise throughout the organization instead of just waiting for it and hoping that it's going to bubble up. So Mike is thinking right to left. I'm thinking from top to bottom. You get all those directions right and then good things are going to happen.